Coming up on Tech News Today, Instagram angers everyone. Apple and Samsung back in court. Judge Coe's loving it. And a new Amazon smartphone rumor. Next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, December 18th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs, and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, Go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Yesterday, we mentioned Instagram's new terms of service would allow the company to share data with Facebook starting January 16th. One paragraph in those new terms of service also states Instagram can sell ads that display your username, likeness, photos, and more without your consent or any share of the revenue. The internet is mad about that. Internet smash. Well, on a happier note, you know what I love most about the holidays? Oh, the holidays. Patent wars! Yes! It's back! Everybody's favorite judge, Lucy Ko, has denied an injunction request by Apple to permanently ban a number of Samsung devices. Ko doesn't deny that Samsung violated certain patents, but Apple failed to show that it lost sales to Samsung specifically because of them. Judge Ko also denied, a Samsung, uh, denied Samsung a new trial to alleged jury misconduct. In Europe, Samsung has also withdrawn its request to ban Apple products in Germany, the UK, France, Italy, and the Netherlands, according to The Verge, which got a statement from the company, though Samsung has confirmed it's still pursuing compensation. Hacker Christopher Cheney has been sentenced to prison for 10 years after pleading guilty to a number of counts, including wiretapping and unauthorized access to a computer. Cheney broke into several women's personal accounts, including Scarlett Johansson, and posted revealing photos of them online. If you're from Schleswig in Germany, you have rights, like the right to be called Strulgeschicht on Facebook instead of your real name. The Office of the Data Protection Commissioner for the state of Schleswig-Holstein ordered Facebook to stop enforcing its real name policy because it violates a German law that gives users the right to use nicknames online. Facebook has two weeks to comply or object to the order in court. Apple reportedly is in discussions to integrate local data from Foursquare into its not quite beloved Maps app. This is according to Wall Street Journal's sources in an effort to keep users from depending on Google search for that local data. Rumors started swirling last week after Apple senior VP Eddie Q posted a Foursquare check-in to Twitter. Google's introduced a new iOS app called YouTube Capture. The free app lets users quickly record videos, then upload to YouTube, Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. Right now, the app is designed for the iPhone. YouTube product management director Shiva Rajaraman says that an Android version is something the company would explore. One overriding principle in the world of technology is that a wired connection will always be faster and more reliable than a wireless connection. But DARPA wants to change that. The U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency has launched a program to create an airborne network with 100 gigabit per second bandwidth. The 100 gigabit per second RF backbone, or 100G, aims to be deployed both on the battlefield and aboard airplanes and work at distances over 200 kilometers. Specs of NVIDIA's next-gen Tegra processor for smartphones and tablets have leaked. Codenamed Wayne, the Tegra 4 will reportedly feature four regular cores and a low-power companion core to save battery life. The CPU, described as a 4 plus 1 quad-core Eagle, is likely to be a Cortex A15, codenamed Eagle. If all this is true, the Tegra 4 will have six times the graphical power of current-gen Tegra chips thanks to a 72-core GPU setup. 
You know how we always say now HTML5 is not a standard yet? Mm -hmm. Well, it's still not, but it got closer. The W3C published the complete definition of HTML5 along with Canvas 2D, meaning the spec is feature complete. That means developers have a stable set of rules to plan with. HTML5 now moves into the candidate recommendation stage uh, of the reality show, this uh, American HTML5, devoted to interoperability and testing. W3C also announced the first draft of HTML5.1. I was going for America's Next Top Standard. That's that's what I was trying. Oh, that's a good show. Just, yeah. Anyway. Very catty. A Facebook profile page is making news today. It appears as though Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei joined Facebook on December 13th. Now, his timeline has links to his speeches as well as photos of himself. Facebook is banned in Iran via government filters, and Iranian authorities haven't commented on the site, which leads some to believe that the page is not genuine. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ring Central. We we didn't actually build this building, but we, all the stuff in it we we had to pick here. And and when Leo was putting it all together, hey, we wanted to do as much in the cloud as possible. We want to leave room for sets and pretty things like the you know the books and the decorations and all that. Uh, so Russell, our IT guy, said, well, don't run a big PBX system in the basement. Do Ring Central. Use your phone system from the cloud. We love Ring Central. Zero startup costs, none of that PBX hardware to install or maintain. And Ring Central allows us to easily customize all of our call handling. You can get our voicemail coming to our email. We can get faxes uh, sent to our smartphones. Ring Central offers all inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user. And you can start right now with a 30 day risk free trial and a special offer for our listeners when you buy one desk phone. Get a second phone free. You can do it up to 20 phones. So call this number designated for our listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. One more time, 800-543-9980. Say it with me. Or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. That's ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. We thank Ring Central for their continuing support of Tech News Today and for the phone that's right here on my desk. Thanks, Ring Central. Joining us now to talk about the stories of the day, it's good to have Patrick Beja back one more time before the end of the year. Nice beard, Patrick. Thank you. Yes, it's the bearded Beja. Wait, no, <laughs> I need another another uh, word that starts with B to make it a nice alliteration. It's the boastful bearded Beja. My beard is the most beardy of them all. There you go. Triple beard threat. Uh, and yeah, we, I've been we, working on that intro for, you know, the past five minutes. So oh, well, I hope well, you like it. Well, bien sûr you have. <laughs> uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to, good to have you, man. Uh, let's, let's start off. It was good to hear Patton Wars one last time before the end of the year, wasn't it, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, is, is, is that, is that Patton Wars being laid to rest? I don't. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean. I know U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe hopes so. <laughs> If, maybe if we say it's the last one, then yeah. it will be. But no, I don't think anyone thinks that that's true. Oh, uh, Lucy Co got one last chance to see her favorite lawyers from Samsung and Apple in court, uh, and was and, and issued the following rulings uh, yesterday: no injunction. Apple has not proven that infringement of its design patents caused irreparable harm. So uh, they can't stop Samsung from selling, selling phones. Uh, they have not established that either the 915 or the 163 patents actually drive sales of any Samsung products. Sure, the jury found Samsung infringed, but Apple was arguing that, you know, Samsung is stealing market share because of that. Judge Lucy Coe said it doesn't look like they are. Uh, Coe was sympathetic to the trade dress claim that Apple said we, we need an injunction because these devices look like our devices. However, the problem with that is all of the devices that were found to infringe on trade dress are no longer being sold. So even if she put an injunction out, it wouldn't be against anything that's on the marketplace mm -hmm. right now. Uh, on on Samsung's side, they didn't win. Basically, Co was like no to everybody. Uh, Samsung wanted a retrial based on the fact that jury foreman Velvin Hogan had uh, not disclosed all of his background regarding uh, Seagate and a bankruptcy. And Seagate and Samsung uh, did business in the past. And they said, well, maybe he was against Samsung. The judge found not clear that Hogan intentionally concealed or even knew of any relationship between Seagate and Samsung. 
Uh, so she's like, we're not we're not doing a retrial. She's like, look, Samsung, you could have asked about Seagate in the jury selection more than you did, and you you didn't do that. So that we don't get to start the clock over. Now. So it looks like Samsung's got to pay that hefty one billion fee then. Well, damages is yet. To, she's got one more decision. She gets to see these guys one more time when she issues her damage ruling. Samsung's asking for it to be reduced, mm -hmm. as you might guess, and right. Apple is asking for it to be increased. Yeah, you know what? Now that we've thought about this some more, <laughs> Samsung is still a big. P-I-T-A, and we'd like them to pay $2 billion. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason why Apple couldn't get the injunction is because there's no irreparable harm. Now, uh, Apple has, has licensed its patents to HTC, so that means money is good enough. That's why they're, they're not going to be pulling devices from shelves. You will be able to buy the products because Apple's already shown, yeah, by the way, if you pay us money, we'll let you do whatever you want. But in this case, Apple's asking for more than that, so that's why the products will still be out there. Patrick, are you hoping this is the last we hear of, of major patent battles? Do you, do you think we have hope for patent peace in 2013? My hope was actually that you wouldn't call on me for this story, <laughs> but I guess I should have told you. Um, wow. I, I'm usually trying to be super reasonable and measured and everything, but you are here to do that for the audience. So I can just say, I am sick of this story. Like, it's... <laughs> I've been, you know, soldiering on and going like, yes, this is important. This is how things get settled. It's, you know, we should be paying attention. It's the industry defining itself. But wow, I, I starting to begin to understand how Judge Co, Co uh, is feeling. And I don't envy her. Uh, just get it over with. Yes, I hope it's the last time we hear about it. Yes. I think you speak on behalf of many in the audience, so I'm, I'm glad I did call <laughs> on you. Uh, let's move on, along to Hulu announcing a, a bunch of numbers. Uh, how are they doing after 2012? Hey, you know, 2012 was a pretty good year for Hulu. Uh, CEO Jason Kilar wrote up a blog post um, it, titled A Big 2012 and had some very impressive numbers. Uh, so we'll read a few of them here. Revenue, $695 million, which is an increase of 65% over the year before. Subscribers also up 50% from 2 million just back in April to 3 million by December, which doubled from Q4 of this time last year. So again, revenue's up, subscribers are up. Both revenue and subscriber numbers, uh, as any of our video viewers can see, we've uh, Hulu put together some, some little nice charts and graphs. Uh, they are not only up, but they're up more than they were between 2010 and 2011. 2011 to 2012 was a, was, was a much higher jump um, as far as both the money and, and, and the folks that are using Hulu and Hulu Plus. Available on 320 million devices in the U.S., which is not including laptops and desktops, which I think is very interesting. I remember when I when I first tried out Hulu for the first time, it was on my laptop. And even though Hulu, I, I pay for Hulu Plus, Hulu Plus has some issues where there was a two seasons ago of 30 Rock. You could only watch it on your laptop and you couldn't actually watch it on your Roku. And that was very annoying. Still, you got 320 million devices of people who are accessing Hulu, which is not including the web version. So even with those restrictions, it, it's, e it's easy to access. Uh, Hulu and Hulu Plus titles, because of course not everything on Hulu is on Hulu Plus, grew by over 40%. And then they also, they, they made partners and advertisers really happy. Spent $500 million on new content, generated $1 billion for content partners, launched 25 Hulu exclusive and original series shows. The booth at the End was great. That was one of my favorite shows of the year. See, there, there you go. So it's, I mean, not, not just content that is original, but content that people go, this is great. And you can really get on Hulu. I really like this. And of course, that spreads the word. Served over 1,000 different advertisers, uh, which was up 28% over 2011. Now, I don't want to say anything about loving Hulu advertisers because I I, I, I do pay for Hulu Plus and I, I know that it's a lot of people can't get past the fact that you pay for something that still has advertisement. But one of the most annoying things is seeing the same advertisement over and over. So I did see some more variety That's as just good. a Hulu Plus uh, watcher uh, and user. So when I look at all of this, I know that a year, about a year ago, let's just say, a lot of us were saying, you know, what is going to be the future for something like Hulu? They're, you know, they're, they're in with the networks, but it's a, it's a, it's a very shaky situation. And if one pulls out, is, is, is this business model even viable? I think to me, this is just a trend of why it's, 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 it's 
it's it's proven that people are cutting the cord and they're at least trying other methods of getting regular content. I am one of those people. So Hulu is my way to get a lot of the shows that I would have no access to uh, otherwise and to be able to to get it legally. I don't know if it's proof that they're cutting the cord so much as sometimes cutting the cord, sometimes shaving the cord, as they call it, when uh -huh. you just reduce your service. Right, right. Uh, and, and also, you know what I use Hulu for a lot of the times is just not managing my DVR. If it's, you know, like, oh, there was a conflict. Oh, I forgot to set a season pass. I, I can go to Hulu a lot of the times right. and catch up on stuff that way. I, I have to say, Jason Kalar is a freaking magician. I mean, think of what he's doing here. Look at the $695 million increase of 65%. This man has competitors who don't believe in his project, right? They're, they see it. They, they're competitors with each other who are backing this, right? Compet competing networks who see the product as undermining their main business and they try to hobble it at every stretch by oh we're not going to allow things for 28 days or, or we're going to we're going to block this and only allow it on mobile but not on laptops and uh he's trying to sell advertising into something you pay for and so everyone looks at this on the face of it and goes well wait a minute why, why would i pay for that and yet he's made an incredibly successful business out of this people should be like dying to hire jason collar to run their businesses he's he's made a mountain of gold out of nothing Earlier this year, he was rumored to take over Yahoo. That was the big name bandied about was Jason Killar. But for Hulu, it seems like they've managed to get themselves on more devices. They're on the Apple TV finally. They're on the Wii. They're on the Wii U. They're on these lots of different devices. And it's that experience you get when you try it out. Because I think they come with usually like a free week or free two-week trial. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, this is actually pretty good. And I think people are getting more and more used to paying for content. I think it's really a kind of the tablet culture at this point. Because when you get the app, which, which is free, you can't watch anything until you pay for it. And I think people are getting used to that when it comes to television-style content, especially because this isn't just like uh, user-generated stuff. This is professional television-quality stuff that you're getting for a decent price. And it's still cheaper than cable. That's the big hook, I think. Because, yeah, there's advertising. But there's advertising on cable as well. So maybe this is the kind of thing that makes people go, all right, I can pay for this and still get two ads without getting too upset. You know, Tom, you make a really good point about it almost replacing your DVR at times. A lot of the uh, shows that I subscribe to on Hulu, Saturday Night Live, New Girl, uh, The Mindy Project, that stuff, it, that's network television. Yeah. I have no idea when it airs on network TV. And I feel like... I mean, of course, I could I could watch Saturday Night Live on Saturday night if I wanted to, but I really like the convenience of watching when I feel like it because it is a bit like a very cheap DVR because I don't have a cable subscription. I have no other way to record anything. I'm doing everything uh, over the air. And, you know, I think that's, that's a little bit key as well, what you're saying, Sarah, because what it means is, sure, the, you know, Hulu has, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the, of the uh, CEO, uh, Jason Kalar, Kalar, is it? Hilary, thank you. Um, sure, I'm sure he deserves a, a lot of the credit for all of this, but there's also something to be said for um, how much of the, the, the market craves for these kinds of solutions. And that's also something that shows it's, it's, it's being pulled into existence because of that craving uh, and because everyone wants a product like this. And uh, as we turn the page on 2012, uh, you know, Netflix a year ago was, of course, a force to be reckoned with, but it wasn't as as much of an industry um, uh, behemoth as it is now. And Hulu is also out of the, the, the woods, it seems. Uh, these numbers seem to indicate. So what stri what's striking uh, to me is that these two companies are now unavoidable in the landscape of uh, the industry. They're not big, but you can't pretend like they don't exist. And that's something that's that has changed very quickly. Uh, it, basically, they've turned it around in about a year. Um, they're not, you know, completely safe yet, but it seems like they're on pretty solid ground. Um, that seems to me to indicate that they're going to stay and the, the demand people are realizing serious people in the industry are realizing, okay, this is not going away. People want it. We need to make it work somehow. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have YouTube trying to enable you to be able to shoot crappy video anywhere you are. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's your choice to shoot crappy video or not. I assume uh, Google's got that new iOS app called YouTube Capture. I've got it attached to the TriCaster, I think. So we can take, I, the best way to show this is actually by using the app. 
you can see this is my iPad. If I try to hit record, there's a default on this. It says rotate your screen because there's a landscape block feature, which if you enable it, won't let you record in this portrait mode because those portrait videos are kind of ugly when yeah. you look at it on the web. So they look if, you like just, crap. if you rotate it and we can take a look at this beautiful video of Sarah's desk that we're taking right now. Look at the, the happiness right there. Great. Very nice. Great. Yes. Nice plant. Thank you. <laughs> So it's an I, iPhone and iPod Touch only device uh, application right now. I'm using it on my iPad. It's it's only in portrait when I'm trying to edit uh, information for the YouTube uh, application. So I write the title. This is very exciting. You can see right away though. You can connect it to Google Plus, Facebook, and Twitter all at the same time if you want to. There's also enhancements on the video, which it, this I think is kind of a neat feature. You can actually see a live preview of the video as you can change the color correction and stabilization. You got an, a minor, I mean, you got a tiny bit of editing capabilities by editing the video if you want. You can't splice videos like in the Vimeo app or anything, but this is a good start. And if you want, you have access to 21 different YouTube soundtracks. So because we're having a good time, we'll have a disco music if I want to hear that. Can't hear it. Uh, yeah, I don't Maybe know. Maybe not to play. But there are different songs you can put on this. You can't upload your own music for this. Because I'm sure YouTube does not want to be seen as facilitating any any weird copyright well, they, infringement. You know, yeah, it's not even just seen as. It's it's going to cause blocks because you're likely going to upload copyrighted music. So I'm going to hit share, and it's going to upload. And it uploads videos at 480p or 720p, and it can do that in the background. It's definitely an interesting and really easy way to get videos onto YouTube and these other social networks. Uh, you guys saw the demo. I don't know, Sarah, did you get to play with this app? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, Vimeo actually, you mentioned Vimeo uh, mm -hmm. just uh, recently updated its iOS app. Uh, it's really nice. <laughs> it's funny to me that the YouTube app is now now saying, "Hey, you want to record some videos and and upload them to YouTube through the YouTube app? You can do that." Uh, so that's it, it's. I think it really comes down to. I mean, YouTube is the biggest photo, not only photo, uh, sorry, video social network, but you know, sort of like video storage locker. So. If you're already familiar with YouTube and using YouTube and wanting to upload stuff to YouTube, it makes perfect sense. Um, I know that there are, are, are other options for people, so you're probably not going to be uploading a lot of videos to both YouTube and Vimeo. People tend to choose one or the other, uh, but YouTube's the, YouTube's the big guy, and I, I think, yeah, this is uh, long overdue. Patrick, do you think this is uh, Google just getting ready for Apple to boot out even more Google functionality like a YouTube up to, uh, update? Um. I don't know that there's anything left to boot out, is there? Uh, maybe, well, the camera yeah, app on iOS still allows you to post yeah. to YouTube. I guess. I mean, YouTube has been on a on a on a rampage lately. Uh, I'm sorry, not YouTube, but Google. They've basically updated and improved incredibly all of their apps. Uh, I think they just wanted a proper app on on iPhone and Android. I guess it's is coming that uh, that sense as well. Uh, they're all fantastic. I don't see why they wouldn't do it. Uh, they want to control their, their environment, their ecosystem, and provide the best experience they can. Uh, and I think that is it. Um, so I guess it's better to be safe than sorry, but I don't know that this is the first uh, motivation for them to release the app. I think they just want to have something of theirs that they can ensure is the best experience they can have. All right. Uh, it's interesting to see YouTube kind of playing it from both ends, both on the high end, trying to bring in the celebrities and the stars, and but also still giving you tools to be able to shoot those cat videos on skateboards when cats skate by, as they do. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Audible.com, the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. And you, because you happen to be watching or listening to Tech News Today right now, get a free audiobook. Don't tell anyone. Actually, tell everybody. Give everybody this URL. It's audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. Spread it wide and far. Oh. Spread holiday cheer wide and far. Is that better? Yes. Holiday, holiday cheer. Yeah. One audiobook you might consider downloading is the one that Jason Howell's been listening to. <laughs> Who am I? It's uh, Pete Townsend's uh, autobiography. He actually reads it himself. 
Is it just I'm Pete Townsend and that's the end? <laughs> uh, yeah, for seven. Oh, for who almost I am, eight, not for who or I am. sorry, sorry, who I am? Uh, for almost eighteen hours, that's all he says. Uh, no, it's it's a pretty fascinating kind of a, a book. You know, in the author's words, it's always kind of nice when you get an audio book that's spoken by the person that wrote the book. Um, I didn't realize that the first four hours or so, and I was like, God, this guy's really good at reading this book. And then I realized it was him. Uh, but you know, if you're a fan of the Who or even just rock bios, which I tend to tend to be the only thing I listen to these days. Uh, it's a fantastic audiobook. You can get that or any audiobook. They've got science fiction. They've got nonfiction. They've got tech books in there. They've got periodicals. Go get a free audiobook if you don't already enjoy Audible at audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. And how about a second one? Get Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free at audible.com slash Sanderson. That's audible.com slash S-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Uh, so you get a free one credit book with audiblepodcast.com slash TNT and a free Brandon Sanderson book, Legion, with audible.com slash Sanderson. We thank Audible for their support of Tech News Today. It's the perfect holiday gift. Okay, here's the elephant in the room we haven't been talking about. Instagram, new terms, January 16th. You agree that a business or other entity may pay us to display your username likeness, photos, along with any associated metadata and or actions you take in connection with paid or sponsored content or promotions without any compensation to you. Uh, now, Instagram, in a follow-up statement, this is not part of the terms of service, explain this because a lot of people are angry, saying this means we can do things like fight spam more effectively, detect system and reliability problems more quickly, build features for everyone by understanding how Instagram is used. Uh, a lot of people pointing out these are the same terms Facebook has when you upload a photo to Facebook. So Facebook now owns Instagram. It makes sense that these terms would be the same. But a lot of people are saying, look, I don't want Instagram associating my photos with advertisements without telling me. And in fact, Instagram says in their terms that they don't have to say whether something's an advertisement or not when they put it in their feed. So Noah Kalina, for instance, is a professional photographer. He took photos at Mark Zuckerberg's wedding on Instagram he posted a screenshot of the new terms and a long explanation of why he does not like them. He says, my name, face, and photographs are not only valuable, they're my livelihood. You cannot take this thing from me for free. The solution is pretty simple. All you have to do is change this clause and say you will ask me first. Uh, but it's, you cannot opt out. And you don't get to opt in. You just If you're using Instagram, this is going to happen starting January 16th, which means services like Instaport and Copygram are getting heavy traffic as people download a lot of their Instagram photos out because they're upset about this and they've decided they don't want to use Instagram anymore. Is this hypocritical, Patrick Beja, of the Internet mm -hmm. that's always about free, that's always angry at the movie and music industries for locking things down in DRM, for, 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 for you know, fighting piracy? Is this hypocritical for them to say, well, wait a minute, if Instagram wants to take photos that I've given them for a free service and sell ads against them, I don't like it? Yes. All right. Well, okay. No, uh -oh. slightly <laughs> longer answer. Uh, yes, it is incredibly hypocritical. It's always been hypocritical, but uh, I'm usually of the opinion that the, 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 all of this is the internet being the internet. You know, when terms of service change, you get people angry and riled up and they're, and they say, you know, I'm going to quit this. This is unacceptable. This is my, my private, you know, data and, and habits and what have you. And usually they don't leave. And I don't think they're going to leave here in this case either. But for me specifically, I'm usually not too bothered by all of these these uh, changes in terms of service. And I sort of accept, accept it as the cost of doing business. You know, if I want to use Facebook, then I have to give a little bit of my privacy away. Uh, in this case, for a reason I'm not quite sure uh, I understand, it's rubbing me the wrong way. It's It really bothers me when it usually, you know, just let it slide, it's whatever. Here, it's I guess it's the image of Instagram using my photos and my comments, maybe, you know, to promote a business saying, Patrick Beja says, this is the best rest restaurant in town. And I'm like, yes, I said it. And I'm, I said it publicly on Instagram, but I'm not sure I, I like this thing. And I don't know why I like it less than the same terms of service on Facebook. 
Uh, but yeah, it does bother me. And I did go to Instaport and exported all my my pictures uh, from from Instagram for the you know the third time in two years. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not going to quit Instagram, I don't think. But I don't really need Instagram either. I guess you know we're going to be talking about Flickr. If Flickr can provide me with the same kind of service, which is basically post to Facebook, Twitter, Google, you know whatever then I can use something else. I'm not sure Instagram is in a dominant enough position that it couldn't, people couldn't just flock to somewhere else. Um, ben, yeah, I don't know. It bothers me, and I don't know why. Ben J. Photo in the chat room says it's not hypocritical. DRM keeps you from using something you've paid for. Using my images commercially is using something you haven't paid for. But hasn't Instagram sort of paid for it by providing you the service, Sarah? I think they they have. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah. Oh, it's okay. I, you can be Sarah if you want to. It's fine. I'll be back. Hello, I am French. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, this whole thing is, it's a little confusing um, because the terms of service are, are, are pretty clear. Neil Patel actually is, uh, he's having a field day with this on Twitter. Uh, of course, Red for the Virgin is also a lawyer saying, you know, their old terms of service kind of said this too. They just didn't say it as explicitly. So they're going to have clearer terms of service in mid-January, and now everybody's freaking out. Like, they're just going to, you're going to have billboards of your photos displayed all over the internet, and you're not going to get a cent. He says, Instagram isn't selling your photos. They are letting advertisers pay to redisplay them, and they can't modify them at all. Right. That means if there's an advertiser who says, I love that picture of that Eiffel Tower that Sarah took, to redisplay the photo does not mean adding text, does not mean cropping in any sort of way, does not mean changing it at all. That said, I still think that this is something that upsets people. Listen, photos are photos. They're supposed to be my own. And, you know, Flickr is a free service too. And Flickr has always said that we own our own photos. There is a pro version, of course, but 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 that's you're not paying to own your own photos when, when you put a photo up on Flickr. So, yeah, it's... It's probably inevitable, but I can see why this is upsetting to people. I, I think is it's, it upsetting? It, it, do you think it's it's normal that it up, it's upsetting people, or more specifically me, more than other similar terms of services for other services, or is it just me being weird? No, I think I think a lot of people are looking at this as well. Instagram has done a lot of things over the course of the year that have rubbed me the wrong way, and now they're doing this too. The la it's sort of the last straw that breaks the camel's back. These terms of service are not overly egregious. Nilay Patel is right. This is a case of the lawyers writing broadly enough to make sure that Instagram can do what they want. They want to be able to put a promotion up that shows some real photos from real users, and they don't want the users to be able to sue them for that. That's what this is about. But it, you can imagine it being used for other more nefarious purposes, and that's what got people all upset about this. Uh, I do think that... Instagram probably isn't going to lose all of their users over this, but the fight with Twitter over the API, the you know the 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 other controversies they've had over the course of the year, it will start to erode away. And Flickr is in the perfect position with their new app and their new service, and people starting to talk about them to move in and take advantage of that. Still, let's talk about uh, hey, Apple and uh, talks with Foursquare about a data sharing deal. Yeah, this is this is kind of, this is kind of exciting. Uh, particularly because I was just in Patrick's fair city of Paris uh, using Foursquare quite a bit because Foursquare, as of late, has changed the... It's sort of like the... Uh, if you're using Foursquare for the first time, it used to be you check into places and if you check in more than all your friends, you become mayor and you're kind of competing against them with points by going to a lot of different places. You can still do all of that stuff. Um, but now there's a, more of an effort to... Uh, to to allow people to explore what's around them. So if I'm in an unfamiliar neighborhood, an unfamiliar city, I go ahead and fire up Foursquare, I hit explore, and I can see if friends of mine have tips or, or even if this is just a popular place that a lot of people go to and this is a good coffee shop. So Foursquare wants to be a lot more like a Yelp competitor um, and has been moving that way for a while. Wall Street Journal is reporting Apple is in talks with Foursquare about using that local data that Foursquare is gathering from all of us to add into Apple Maps. And that EddieQ is involved in the talks. So these are, you know, while preliminary, still at least high-level talks. Um, like I mentioned in the news views, he had checked into Foursquare last week and posted that, auto-posted it to Twitter 
which had a lot of people saying, oh, this must this must be it. Uh, no, uh, Apple already has a deal with Yelp uh, in Apple Maps. It's something that I think is pretty good. But Yelp and, and Foursquare have different data sets. Not everybody is using both. And Foursquare would definitely beef up local search. Now, of course, that's local search, meaning if you fire up Apple Maps and you want to see stuff that's around, you know, there might be the coffee shop that now... That, uh, that 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 arrives on the corner, you click on it, and then you can see uh, tips from Foursquare friends or strangers. That's stuff that might not already be there with all of the Yelp data that Apple Maps is using. What's also interesting is, is kind of, okay, well, how important is this Foursquare data? Because in my uh, experience, certain cities and areas work a lot better than others because there's just a lot of engagement in, in certain metropolitan areas, particularly metropolitan areas, and other cities don't work as well. Uh, or you get kind of bad reviews from people that you don't necessarily know or, or wouldn't have a lot in, in common with. Foursquare says they have uh, 25 million registered users, but as far as active users who are using it at least once a month, only about 8 million of them. So yes, Foursquare is collecting quite a bit of data. Is this the right data for Apple Maps? I think... Again, in certain areas, yes, and Apple Maps can use more of this than what they have now in order to compete with Google for local data, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure even Yelp and Foursquare together put Apple Maps even in the same category as what you can get from a Google search. I mean, I think it's Apple just building some kind of library. The thing about Apple Maps that's been taking the hit is accuracy. The thing about Foursquare is like people are more than willing to put in information that wasn't there. So like, I want to check into Twit. If it's not in there, I'll actually put it in and put the address. It's like a clever way of crowdsourcing in some respects. Mm -hmm. As long as they can put it up against the database that they already have, I think it'll help their accuracy. It's, just, it, it's a lot of building blocks for Apple to build their reputation in maps because they took that giant hit and saying, hey, we have the best maps ever. And these were far from the best maps ever. I think that's an easy statement to say. So this is probably just this right step in the right direction. Well, if you thought that that was it when it comes to local data, you would be wrong. Because meanwhile, Facebook, yeah, we talked yesterday about how Facebook might be building some sort of a Snapchat alternative because Snapchat is kind of the big cool thing right now. These these photos that don't last that long, you know, that, that self-destructing data. Facebook nearby is kind of, you could say, Facebook's latest Foursquare clone. Um, so what you do now, and this is uh, this is actually, is the last time I checked, which was a couple hours ago, I did not actually have the updated version of this, uh, which is uh, available for Facebook on iOS or Android. But the idea is, is that it is rolling out slowly to all users. You open up the nearby tab. Currently, or until now, you would have seen just a, a list of places to check in that are nearby. What it will be going forward is a relevancy sorted list of local businesses, landmarks based on who your friends are on Facebook, where they've checked in, what you like, what they like, to kind of give you more of a, here's what you might be looking for, Sarah, which is very similar to what Foursquare is doing. And they're, they're banking on the fact that if you're already using the Facebook experience for so many other things, regular check-ins, adding photos, chatting with friends on Messenger, then you'd you'd likely use it as a place to learn more about what's new and cool and a good place to eat around you as well. Location, uh, location, location. Yeah. Yeah. Let's finish up with a rumor about an Amazon smartphone. Right, the Taiwan. It wouldn't be 2012 without a rumor about <laughs> got, a phone. There's got to be a new phone, right? If it's not a Facebook phone, it's an Amazon phone. Taiwan Economic News saying that Amazon has ordered 5 million handsets from Foxconn. And the phone would launch in quarter two or quarter three of next year. It costs 100 to $200 at launch. Now, back in July, Bloomberg reported Amazon was planning a smartphone, and they obviously make tablets right now. Uh, but I guess my question is, you know, when, when, when Amazon came up with the Kindle, the e-reader, it was an immature market. When they had, came into the tablet market, somewhat immature, the Fire was serviceable. Does a Fire phone have to be amazing, or does it just have to be good enough to gain traction, Patrick? It has to be good enough. I think it has to be relatively cheap. Um, and... The, I guess the, the thing that struck me here is we got numbers from um, Black Friday and, and the, the you know holiday sales and stuff like that. And all of them show an incredible trend towards uh, shopping from mobile devices. And Amazon being the retailer 
uh, a giant that they are, can't ignore this. And I guess it must be going well for the Fire in that respect as well. And they need to also be in the in the phone uh, business. So, of course, if they end up not doing a, full, uh, a phone, everything I just said, I didn't really think it. Uh, but if they do do a phone, that's probably the explanation. Because I don't really see... I don't really see a Kindle phone as a great consumption, uh, media consumption device. It's a terminal to buy stuff on Amazon for them, I, I would think. Sarah, do you think the this, this smartphone market is too mature for another competitor like this? Because this is just another phone. Kind of. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that we shouldn't be innovating with smartphones, but I just don't see how there would be... Uh, such a huge market of folks saying, I have held off until now because I've never seen anything that was good enough. But and this that's is not, it. That's not who they're going to be, who they're going to be selling to. That, that, it's not people who are going to think, oh, right, which awesome phone that has ex excellent, you know, features and functionalities am I going to buy today? It's going to be people who walk in the, the, the door of a shop and say, you know, what can I, what can I get for that amount of money, which is probably not a huge amount, and people are going to see, you know, this is Amazon, you, you shop sometimes there, you can do that easily, plus you get fun features and, and stuff, and it's easy to use because it has that weird Android, not really Android thing. Yeah, sure, get me that. Yeah, you know. And that's what, you know, it's that many more purchases that they can solicit uh, for, their, for their site. Yeah, the important part of this, at least this is a rumor. Oh, that's not my camera. There we go. Um, <laughs> is the one hundred to two hundred dollar price point, and if that's off subsidy, that's a pretty darn inexpensive phone that Amazon is kind of, you know, using their service to kind of subsidize for you. Uh, well, we don't. That could possibly. Be the sub, that could be the subsidized. It could, price. It could it's be. A rumor. If it's and my guess is that the subsidized price. Yeah, man. If that could be the unsubsidized price, they'd have they'd have a big winner. Um, but I don't I, know. I don't know how much is the Kindle Fire. Kindle Fire is right. Yeah, it's like two, yeah, two hundred, two fifty, two forty nine. Right. God, like, yeah. uh, I know HD. it's just the screen, but they could, and, that, and that's unsubsidized. So I'm sure they could make a phone that is relatively cheap as well. Uh, if well, it's it not is, super, it, it, the fancy. tablet is subsidized, but it's subsidized by Amazon, well, wanting that, you to spend things right. with the and Amazon. That's exactly so what I, I mean. would hope that they would do that with the phone. But mm -hmm. when you say hundred or two hundred dollars. Uh, that just sounds like like a subsidy price because that's what most phones are. It's well, the handset could just be a glorified price check scanner. I mean, that's all Amazon mm -hmm. really needs. You go into a store, you showroom, you're like, oh, I'm going to click this and use price check by Amazon, which is built into the camera <laughs> app. And immediately you have this really interesting approach that Amazon could use. Let's finish up with the randomizer. I know we said we'd finish up with the Amazon the smartphone, randomizer. but we really finish up with the randomizer. Yeah. That's the way we do it. Uh, and we've got YouTube's Rewind 2012 mashup. Uh, which has Cy and Felicia Day and Hannah Hart and lots of YouTube stars available now. Uh, it, it's kind of trying to mash up all of the YouTube hits from the year, uh, Gundam Style being the biggest, of course, and the Carly Rae Jepsen song, uh, Call Me Maybe, is featured in there. You don't see Carly Rae Jepsen. In fact, it's it's uh, Felicia Day actually redoing the Carly Rae Jepsen video on, on the car. Lots of Lots of cameos in here, but... Here's my problem. I'm 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 old. Me I'm too. Tired. I don't recognize Mo. There's Hannah Hart. There's Felicia Day. Okay, I recognize two people in a row. Uh, but it, there's a lot of people in here that are big on YouTube. Yeah, it's I a don't. Whole, a whole separate culture. I don't know who. I don't understand who what the parody is. But I understand that it's YouTube stars. So if you're, I don't know. We're just not watching the right shows. Maybe. Patrick, uh, you, think, did, do you have the same reaction? Did you have the same experience? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I watched it this morning. I'm, I'm sick at home today. Um, and I figured, you know, I'm going to check up the internets in the morning when I wake up. And I ended up spending all morning checking these people up, out because I didn't know who they were. And it was bothering me. And I'm like, am I missing something huge on YouTube on the internet that I didn't know about? It turns out apparently not. Uh, but what struck me again is that there are a lot of people who are making hundreds of thousands of, of uh, uh, you know, who, who have hundreds of thousands of followers who are getting their videos watched quite a bit and that we don't really know about. And what that tells me is 
YouTube is maturing. You yeah. don't necessarily have, if someone has, you know, a, a couple million views, it's not a big deal anymore. And they can be successful. They have their following. They have their, uh, you know, fans. And probably they're making decent money out of it. And it's not such a, a big deal. So uh, they probably included a few people who also don't have millions of fa fans as well uh, in there. But um, yeah, I thought it was kind of nice that it's sort of getting into that cruising uh, speed uh, and, and that a lot of we have a lot of smaller YouTube stars rather than the phenomenon that uh, di not dies, but, you know, disappears after a, a couple of months. It's always dangerous to say, oh, I don't know any of these people, because that also tells to the people who do know these people that you're out of touch. <laughs> you, you obviously don't know what's going on. Uh, and, and I don't in this case. Well, please, if, if dear people listening, uh, if you did know all of these people and if you think we are incredibly weird and uh, too old, please do let us know on Twitter. Yeah, um, don't let interested. me know. I already know. I'm old, I'm old and out of touch. Uh, and full disclosure, my wife works for YouTube in the building where part of that was shot. So. Well, because of her, you are going to know everybody exactly. in the 2013 video. Probably, maybe. Yeah. Call me. Call Let's me. see what's in there. <laughs> we got an email from Jack. He says, at and crew, I listened to your show on the 17th and wanted to throw my two cents in about your discussion about Snapchat. I'm a 13-year-old guy, and me and my friends use and really like Snapchat because you can really be crazy because you know no one will ever see that photo again. I can make a weird, ugly face, and my friend will laugh, but that won't ever be on Facebook or sent to anyone else. There you go. Yeah, we actually got a couple emails from people like, oh, no, I use Snapchat. This is, this is, it's not always for dirty things, so but, thank you. For but that. I will correct you, Jack. All it takes is a camera pointed at the phone at the moment that you open it for that photo to last forever. So be careful. Well, or just no, a screenshot. Yeah, no, no, no. They, they deactivate screenshot on that app, I think. Um, on some no, phones, they at least do. on Android. If you take a screenshot, it notifies the person. Yeah, that no, you, you, ah, you can take a screenshot. Okay. I just, I will know you, that Jason. you're going to show my ugly face to everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I hear a lot about the Snapchat like, oh, well, it disappears forever. So great. This is awesome and liberating. It's like, no, just realize that's... Yeah, Not it doesn't it. work I, that way. And that's that's really the important thing here. It's the, you know, I'm like Sarah was saying yesterday, I think, you know, I, I, I try to get it, but I just don't, I don't understand it. And I think it, I might be over that line where <laughs> I'm just too old to get it. Yeah, I yeah, finally gosh. get to that point. Yeah. Um, but it's just about the perception, I think. They, they create the illusion that, you're not going to see that picture that propagated simple. everywhere. And that's what people like. It doesn't matter that it's true or false. It's that that feeling that they enjoy. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's just weird. <laughs> Got another email from Steve, the tank builder, who says, I knew from listening to your show over the last few months that Google was becoming stingier with access to their Maps API. But I was astounded to notice that on the Moto ACTV website that's owned by Motorola, uh, the attached message, and he has, he has a, a little uh, link he sent us, it says that Motorola is an unauthorized user of the Google Maps API. I hope you and your viewers and listeners found this as interesting as I did. I find it perfectly obvious. It's so funny. This is not the only example of people pointing to Google and Motorola and saying, oh, look at Google not taking advantage of Motorola. Or why is Google doing this? You know, and they're not allowing Motorola in the API. And the big concern that you heard before Google bought Motorola was, are they going to show favoritism right. to Motorola? This, they are obviously not showing favoritism, and then everybody leaps all over that. So it's, it's kind of funny to me. That is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, thank you, Patrick Beja, for joining us. Let folks know uh, where they can find you online, what you're up to uh, You know, these days. I know that you've, you've retired some of your, your podcasts, but you're still doing a bunch. Uh, yes, unfortunately, the English shows uh, had to go away to make room for, you know, life. Um, but the French shows are still uh, alive and kicking if you are interested in uh, French podcasting and the uh, incredibly fun uh, hosts that we have, uh, you can go to nowatch.net and you'll find a large amount of shows that will interest you, I'm certain. And uh, if you want to follow me personally, I'm usually hanging out on Twitter, that thing where you say what you had for lunch, uh, and I'm not Patrick on Twitter. Too busy for English, huh? Well, I'm, I'm glad you... I I'm well, you're glad. doing such a good job at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad. It's always good to have you on, man. Uh, you can find our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. That is the place where you can suggest stories 
for us to follow. It, it helps us put together our lineup every day. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. That's where all our episodes and links to show notes and all that sort of thing happens. You can email us TNT at twit.tv or give me a call at 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Eric Olander. Looking forward to seeing him tomorrow.